Outside of that, I will introduce Michael here. He's the Senior Director of Content Platforms at Avalara. He spent 38 of his 40 years at IBM as a content pioneer leading the design and development of advanced content management systems and tech. And he is a veteran in the industry and it is our honor and our pleasure to have him introduce and presenting here today. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate and uh, uh, the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, please put your comments in the chat area. I promise I will stay uh, longer than the hour if there are questions. I don't want to leave uh, leave any stone unturned. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna and uh, and I'm uh, I'm I'm, I'm told, speaking to you from uh, Western North Carolina in the mountains in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, where I I've moved about a year and a half ago. Got out of the Raleigh Durham uh, traffic uh, craziness. And I really love being up here and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun place to be. Let me uh, share my screen and just jump right into it because I have a tremendous amount of material uh, for you today. And it's gonna, it's gonna be a whole lot. I'll, I'll try to make it uh, reasonable. So yeah, this is a, uh, a session that we're gonna talk a little bit about the next generation of content, the next generation of intelligent content. And boy, that promises a lot, doesn't it? Just those words. Uh, this is not pie in the sky. Everything that I'm going to speak about today is technologically available and ready to do. That's what's really scary about all of this is we've been talking about it for years. We've been talking about intelligent content. We've not really been talking about knowledge, though. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is much more like a guidebook. Uh, or a roadmap. And uh, if you go to my website, thinkingdocumentation.com, you can not only download this chart deck, you can download a fairly substantial paper. It's about 65, 70 pages that I've written that really digs into all of this material uh, in, in depth. Uh, and it really is written more like a narrative and a how-to guide, because I've been to a million you know, webinars and conferences and read papers. And it just seems that everybody stops at intelligent content when you start talking about taxonomy and everybody's eyes water as if you're speaking about particle theory or string theory. And I hope to make things simple today for you or as simple as possible because that's our jobs as information developers is to distill really tough topics and try to make them consumable. So I hope you go to the website and we'll move on. So yeah, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on myself. 38 years at IBM, I had a great run. Uh, I was there from the beginning of markup language, Charles Goldfarb uh, and Elliot Kimber pulled me aside one day and said, you're, you're doing some inventive work. We want you to use this thing called uh, GML and SGML. And I, Elliot left and, and left me holding the bag uh, and said, here, build the first uh, SGML based system. Uh, and uh, I've been trained as, a, as both an information developer, that's my primary career, but in IBM's grand wisdom, uh, they sent all of us writers to programming school for months and months because we were writing about operating systems. Uh, so that was very dangerous to turn a creative person, I'm a right-brained person into a left-brained engineer uh, because now I could tell the, all the engineers exactly what I want built from a creative perspective. Uh, so it's kind of fun being in that position now uh, to do that. Uh, Bunch of invention disclosures. I've been working with AI uh, since back in the early 90s when it was called Expert Systems. It was rule-based AI, it wasn't machine learning. And I formed a team at IBM that created DITA. Uh, if you wanna know the story about DITA and how it almost happened or didn't happen, uh, there's a good blog article on my website. It's rather fascinating and a rather unpublished, uh, previously unpublished story if some of you use DITA. Uh, we were a team of about 10, 12 people we spent uh, about two years developing it and released it to the industry and thought others might like this. And now we have a burgeoning DITA industry with a lot of providers. But this presentation isn't just about DITA. It applies to any format of content. And that's what I like about it. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, it's really simple and obvious, isn't it, right? Don't you get it? Can you read this, this equation? <laughs> this is a real equation out of a knowledge graph cookbook. Um, and uh, the first time I looked at it, I said, this isn't for me. Uh, the problem is, is that 
Uh, this has been the domain of library science majors, uh, master's degree and PhD candidates for quite a long time. And they speak in a language that most of us would not understand. I have a bunch of books and PhD papers and dissertations that I've poured through, and I still kind of understand this now. <laughs> but you don't need to, right? It doesn't need to be this difficult. Uh, so today we're going to talk about what the challenges are for what I call uh, knowledge-based content, not just intelligent content, what the goals, what the roadmap is. And this is the mantra at IBM that we developed way back in the early 80s, and it really took off uh, as a strategy for many companies. As we want to deliver the right content to the right person at the right time and in the right experience. And nobody has that really pulls that apart too much. The right content. What is the right content? For who? Um, Time, interesting. Who's dealing with the temporal aspect of managing what's delivered when? And experience, well, there's a lot of experiences. There's a lot of channels that people get our content through. So if you break this down, it's really a daunting uh, goal. Uh, if you, but people throw it around pretty loosely, but you're gonna see why we're addressing the entire strategic statement in this, uh, in this situation. So we, we need to advance from what I call reactive failure mode content to what I call hyper-personalized or mass personalized proactive and assistive content. We've gotten really good at providing failure mode content. People come to our content when they need help getting a task done. That's been the way it's been since the cave days. Uh, but you know, you know, as an industry, we've mastered creating content generically for everybody, but for nobody in particular. Uh, and we need to get beyond that. And we've been talking about personalization for years, but really nobody's doing it very well. And there's a reason. Uh, we need to also move from what I call just task orientation, which was the big deal to move to, you know, componentized content uh, uh, and move from task oriented content to scenario based content or scenario oriented content. Our products are complex. They usually require that a user do two, three, four, five tasks, and sometimes multiple tasks between multiple products. Do we really deliver customized, personalized content that crosses an entire scenario? Unusual if we do, uh, it's pretty rare, uh, or it's a use case. So the challenge, a lot of talk about our artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, enabled content, in, but a, a very, minimal lack of information about how do you do it? What's the real steps to do it? Uh, the focus has been on this intelligent content thing, uh, but really most of the discussions are stopping at reuse and repurposing and uh, you know, a write ones publish many model. That's great, but people are asking now, is that all there is? Isn't there more? We think we feel like there's more, but we really don't know what that is. Uh, too much focus on creating uh, the intelligent content itself and not enough focus on creating applications using that intelligent content. Uh, way too much focus on chatbots. Uh, we have to crush the notion that AI and machine learning is all about chatbots. That's only one of a slew of applications that we can have that people aren't even thinking about. And I hope to give you some of those examples today. And virtually no discussion about the, what I call the last mile or the last 100 foot connection of fiber to the house. You know, uh, how do we enable what, what, I, what I call and have coined cognitive content retrieval, organization and delivery by machine? It's been treated as if somehow we're gonna throw IBM Watson or Azure or something, you know, AI at the content and it's gonna suddenly be AI and that's not gonna happen. It takes work. It takes a lot of uh, thought. And I'm gonna give you some of those. So where are we today in the industry? Uh, many shops are at horizon one. Uh, they're using a variety of technologies to, to publish and create fast and efficient content production. Uh, they're getting content reuse and purposing uh, out of it. Uh, they have a right once reuse many single source in many instances. You've got a good CCMS, you're using Ditta, you even have a component-based strategy with Markdown uh, you know, or RST. Uh, you can do that. Uh, we have efficient and cost efficient uh, translation, uh, effective translation. Uh, we've learned how to improve our organic site search, 
Uh, we can do omni-channel content delivery and improve content consistency. None of these are difficult to do. Uh, some shops are coming from archaic technologies and they have to work up to this, but this is where the industry has been actually. And uh, you know, for a lot of years, actually at this point, and this is what we call intelligent content. But then we move into the next phase and we're talking about taxonomic classification of our content to add more semantic intelligence uh, to achieve what Tim Berners-Lee called the semantic web. Uh, it's really upon us. That's really what Web 3.0 is gonna be about, by the way, uh, if anybody asks. It's, it's gonna be about, yeah, it's gonna be about cryptocurrencies and blockchain and NFTs, but really it's gonna be about knowledge, not about information. Um, we're, Horizon 2 is what people are developing today, seamless integrated enterprise content experience. They're busting their silos. I'll show you a model that, that is a good silo busting model, but there are others. Um, people want to increase revenue through conversion rate optimization. People are realizing that more than 50% of the time, sales are starting at the technical content level, not at the marketing level, or the, it's the technical content that's actually selling uh, the electronic uh, information uh, that's actually selling and, and doing the closure uh, on those conversions that make sales. We just have trouble measuring it for the most part, but that's where folks are focused. Uh, personalized content, we've talked about it for years. There's multiple ways to do it, uh, but it's really not personalized. It's, uh, it's sort of quasi-personalized. And then we have cross-sell and upsell as well. And then of course, uh, coming new on the scene is robotic content generation. Uh, I'm using a, a, a technology now or starting to use it called Videate. It's an automatic video tour generator that generates your, your videos with all of the navigation and all the voiceover uh, without doing any screen captures and uh, can do it in multiple languages uh, simply by taking your task-oriented documentation or your task-oriented articles and click build a, uh, a complete uh, tour, video tour with no human post-production. It's incredible. Uh, then you have Jasper. You know, some of you have used that. It's coming along. Uh, it's getting better. Uh, then, then we're really into Horizon 3, and this is where we're going to focus today. Uh, really dynamic one-on-one -on -one personalization, truly scalable chatbots, chat not one-off chatbots, a chatbot that could use the entire content corpus as its, as its knowledge base and return precise answers, really precise answers, as well as dynamic recommendations, uh, proactive user assistance. We want the exact collection of information that that user may need the moment they open that help menu, uh, or even proactively if it's not intrusive. Uh, Hyper-personalized content for, uh, for multi-scenarios and, and, and we want to, to do reuse of, of, of AI content discovery and reuse for, for cre during creation. In other, other words, if somebody in support is creating, uh, is, is, is creating um, uh, knowledge-based articles, we wanna get that content back into the mainline documentation. Uh, so uh, we can use it for that. And then there's autonomic user assistance, which is self-healing and adaptive content, I'll explain. So a lot of these things have been tried before and they have failed to deliver on the promise of, of really advanced intelligent content. We've started with templates. Uh, people have tried to standardize on paragraphs. Uh, people have tried to create the golden DTD, the golden schema uh, that never worked. Uh, people tried to force all their content silos into a single CMS, and that just multiplied more CMSs. Uh, and people tried to use a canonical web portal with APIs where they could use the web portal as a distribution, uh, single distri point of distribution. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what's called the semantic uh, content maturity model. And this is really important because this is the layered sequence in which you have to develop a, uh, additional semantic assets in order to be able to enable your content for a lot of these advanced capabilities. First thing is to have what I call intelligent content object containers. Now that could be something like DITA or JSON. Uh, if you're using Markdown, it'll be more work because you'll have to associate uh, that, you'll have to either wrap it in a container that can contain additional metadata or you, or you associate it with another resource that you link to that provides the metadata. So this is not a DITA only or a JSON only kind of thing, but if you've got DITA, you're miles ahead because DITA has a, uh, what they call a document object model structure uh, that everything is contained within another container within another container. So it's really easy to, uh, 
to, to label all of your content with taxonomy, which is the you know, which is another layer or two up. Uh, but you first need to have consistent terminology. You need to have a trusted source of terminology. Uh, the reason why is because if you build your taxonomies, which are basically classifications, or your ontology, which is relationships of concepts, and they don't agree with your terminology, uh, you're building a house of cards and it's gonna blow over real quick. So your terminology is a prerequisite to taxonomy and ontology and knowledge graphs. Uh, and that's what builds our, our, our the source that we need to provide um, intelligent content or knowledge content. So if you take intelligent content, which is those intelligent objects, and you take these semantic assets like terminology, taxonomy, ontology, and knowledge graphs, what you have is what I call cognitive content. And, uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna describe and, and, and define some of these because these terms are really rather not, com not very complex, but they're not described very well. But what we end up with is content as a service uh, that we can do cognitive content retrieval and delivery by algorithmic processes and machines. And the way that works is we get inbound signals from our users, you know, and then we can provide content that is customized and hyper-personalized for the end user. So cognitive content supply chain is a strategy. It's an architecture and it's an operational model that I say, you know, in, it enables dynamic machine-based retrieval, assembly of the content, and delinear of delivery of not necessarily linear content objects to provide humans or, or machine uh, with knowledge that is based on predictive relationships with content objects and inbound signals. That's a complex definition, but I'm gonna break that down some too. So uh, it, it'll make more sense. So the first thing we need to do is, is, is we need content object containers. Like I said, this could be, uh, it's easy, most easily done with a DOM oriented format like DITA or JSON. Uh, but it can be done with, say, Markdown or RST if you're willing to modify the, the content model of those structures or attach an additional resource, uh, associate an additional resource that can contain the additional metadata like taxonomy labels and stuff that, uh, that a machine can predictably, algorithmically uh, process. And that's the key. Um, so... Uh, you know, these are descriptive wrappers or descriptive information, uh, preferably typed content objects. You know, in Ditto, we have uh, concept task reference uh, types of, of uh, maps, collectors. We can create Q&A and FAQs. And the actual files are self-describing. We know which one is a, con a, con a concept and which one is a task and which one is a reference. So uh, you're a bit ahead if you can do that. Otherwise, you might need to augment your non-structured content to have some of that intelligence uh, either within the content or attached to the content, which can be done with even a content management system in properties, for example. So again, this is not limited to DITA, but DITA is a really good model if you happen to be using it and gets you very far. Uh, next thing you really need to do is you need to harmonize your content types. Uh, when I was at IBM, uh, we had an ungodly number of content types. Uh, we went around to all the different parts of the company. We went to marketing, uh, tech doc. We went to partner, developer, support, learning. And what we found out was we had many, many, many dozens of content types that were all overlapping. They used different names. You know, what's a manual versus a guide? What's a white paper versus a study? Um, the most important thing is that you create a model and you boil them down to what the canonical or the, the, the standard names are gonna be for all of your content types. Uh, this is important. Uh, they can be mapped uh, so that either everybody aligns with those with, with, with that subset of, 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 of reference content types, or you can map those content types with your system so that you know if somebody in one system creates you know, something called one name, but it's really the same thing in another system. Uh, you can use a taxonomy to actually equate those two so that they're the same, even if you can't change uh, and align those content types perfectly. But in a perfect world, all of your parts of your company would start to use the same content type naming for all of those content types and not have differentiation because there's no way to tie together all your content silos if things are called different things. That's very, you know, fundamental. 
Uh, this this can be used later on though, and you'll see and you'll see why. Uh, the next thing to do is to do your content journey. Uh, this is a standard content journey. Uh, I've seen it multiple times. Uh, lay out your content journey uh, however you want. Some people like to have an early learn phase. Uh, some people like to have a uh, you know additional phases here, but but this is the temporal thing. This is the thing that helps to find the at the right time part of our mantra. And what you can do is you can map all your content types against these different phases of the journey. And by doing so, you're gonna discover whether or not you've got gaps in your offering. So if marketing needs to produce something that they're not producing for a particular product, along this journey or your support team's not producing something or your developer team is not uh, producing a certain kind of document, uh, you can model your entire content plan this way, but then this becomes intelligence that the system can consume and use uh, in, a, in a machine learning environment. The next thing you need to do is you need to do terminology. I hope some of you have got terminology management systems, or if you don't, I hope you have great spreadsheets uh, but you do need a trusted source of terminology. Everybody needs to be speaking the same lingua franca. And when you develop taxonomies and ontologies, uh, you, all of that plus your content needs to be harmonized. Uh, I like some of the tools out there. Uh, I've been using Acrolinks for years in my old shop. I'm using it in my new shop. There's Congre, there's Hyper STE. Uh, great tools that help you manage terminology you optimize the content so all of your writers are using the same terminology and the same terms and the same, uh, you know, they're aligned completely. And then you can also use it to align your, 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 your taxonomies and your ontologies, all the language in those, in those assets so that they align with your core terminology. So we've had companies that actually would start down the path of developing taxonomies or, or more, and they'd have to stop and back up and go create a terminology database because they didn't have one. Uh, seems fundamental to me, but believe it or not, a lot of companies do not invest in terminology uh, and they need to, and that's a foundational thing to do. Uh, and then you can even use these same tools to improve your content. I'm sure some of you have some of these tools, uh, others may not, but they assure your consistent uh, product names throughout your content. They assure the consistent use of business terminology and tone of voice. It's just a good practice to align your content so that it's consistent. And, and, and consistency of words is the foundation for a knowledge-driven uh, content architecture. Then we have to do a couple of other things. Uh, we need to define our taxonomies. How are we gonna, how are we gonna lay, uh, how are we, are we gonna categorize our content for, for delivery? If you've ever seen, um, if, you know, if you've ever, if, if you've ever used eBay, you've used the taxonomy, you know, you've looked up, I don't know, photography, then it, there's a subset of cameras, and then there's lenses, and then there's manufacturer, Nikon, I'm into photography, so I like that one. Um, but basically, it's a classification of things, it could either be a grouping of, of a, a group classification, or it could be a hierarchy. Uh, this is the intelligence we need to add to our content. Uh, because even if we have data, even if we have self-describing articles that are concepts, tasks, and references, and we have all this intelligence in our structure, that's still not enough. We need to have the taxonomic intelligence in our content. And so it's a, it's a job to go off and, and develop the, these taxonomies. Uh, there's a whole bunch that you could create. The most common one would be, would be your, your, your product taxonomy uh, that has products and feature names. Uh, you might follow that up with a subject taxonomy. Uh, you might even take that journey phase that we had and make that a taxonomy um, <clears throat> and your content types or your personas uh, as well. So you can think of a whole lot of ways to slice and dice these taxonomies and then they're used. They're used for two different purposes. One, when people come to your website, <clears throat> you can have faceted search. They can have a pull down menu and they can they can pick, you know, I, I only want to see, oh, I don't know if you're into computers. I only want to see uh, graphic cards. And of the graphic cards, I only want to see uh, AMD graphic cards. And I only want to see ones with a particular you know, amount of memory on them. Uh, and you can filter down to the content really quick. That's of common use today. That doesn't require advanced knowledge uh, assets. But you'll find out that 
to do dynamic content delivery, to do hyper-personalized content delivery, you also need those taxonomy labels on your content. And if you're developing a taxonomy, it's really nice to have a tool to do it in. Here's one of many. If I show you any tools, uh, I may be using them. They may not be the right tool for you, but I wanna give you an example of one. Here's one called Pool Party. I, I, I tend to like, because it's very easy to use and very visual. Uh, and basically you can create those, those, those classifications and the, those hierarchies, and you can even create uh, uh, aliases. And so very quickly, uh, if not just one person, but this is a team-based tool. So a whole bunch of people around the company can collaborate and collaborate and, and create those taxonomies together that are used throughout the business. So if you've got uh, content sitting in all those different silos I mentioned, marketing, learning, support, partner, developer, you know, regular you know, product doc, uh, you want to have one taxonomy that everybody uses. So that, and that, that unifies your content. And having a tool to do it in like this makes it fun and easy to do uh, in a collaborative way. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you Pool Party. There's others out there like Smart Logic and uh, Mecon, and there's a whole pile of them. They're really good. Uh, if you were to look at that and visualize that taxonomy, here's a taxonomy of viruses. I know they're not uh, they're not cool, but uh, that's what a, you can render a taxonomy and have a visual look at it to see how, what the relationships are, at least within a, a taxonomic. Uh, but taxonomies don't tell you about what's related to things uh, in an ont ontological form. It'll only tell you in a hierarchical or grouping level what's related. Uh, basic concept of machine learning. I hope some of you have already gone through this in your studies but I'll just repeat it for those. Uh, you know, the way machine learning works is they're all about conversations. Um, AI-driven personalization retrieval depends on machine learning. Uh, everything is a conversation, not just chatbots though. Uh, if you deliver a collection of content to your user and that user uh, can make a personalized collection using your cool CMS that does it, many of them do, uh, and that user starts to modify that collection, that's knowledge that could be fed back to the machine. So the machine learns, gee, uh, that user likes to create this particular collection of content. The machine can learn from that user feedback loop. So uh, that's a really important concept. I wanted to make sure that, that we covered quickly. Another one is the idea of where do you put your metadata? Well. I says, as I said, if you're using Ditta, and I am Ditta biased, I happen to happen to be, happen to be uh, you can put it right inside of the files themselves. Um, if you're using a CMS uh, that's got a, a GUI and it's not Ditta, like Drupal or whatever, uh, that can be a form and you put the data in the forms and it gets stored into a structured format on the back end. That's useful. If it's, um, if it's you know, Markdown or RST, you might have to invent some structures uh, to extend Markdown or RST to store it or attach it as a separate resource file. Um, the real neat thing is, is that you can classify in data, you can classify the whole topic or a whole map, uh, but you can even go classify sub elements, sub containers. So if you want to provide to the chatbot, let's say you want a chatbot to be able to mine uh, your topics and rip out machine wise, uh, algorithmically take out just the set of steps that's within a topic and deliver that as an answer in a chatbot. That's a precision answer. Too often these chatbots are returning entire articles or entire collections of articles. And that's not really an answer. That's just narrowing down the search. So what we really wanna to get to our precision answers. And ideally uh, there's two ways to do that. You can either write micro documents, which are tiny little but which are just a, a file with a very little amount of information in it. Or you could have micro content. Micro content is different from micro documents. Micro content is material inside of a single file that you can identify and extract and deliver independently of the entire topic. So important definition to understand the difference between those two. Uh, the other thing is, gee, how am I going to classify all my content? I've got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of pages. Uh, in my last shop, we had 60 million pages. Uh, that's a lot. In my new shop, it's in the tens of 
thousands. It's not bad. Um, but having the writers go in and add those taxonomy labels to your content is a pain. Uh, plus the precision of how well they do it is can be dicey. It's okay to start out that way. Um, ideally, what you want to do, though, is use a tool that will automatically classify the content. It'll take your taxonomy as input, and then it will look at your content, and it will automatically assign the labels to the content, and it will do it at a precision rate better than a human, better than 90% precision or, or even higher. Uh, and, and it learns as it goes, if it's a machine learning algorithm. Uh, Watson, uh, natural language classifier does it, top grade does it, pool party does it. Uh, Again, you know, all great tools, you know, pick your favorite, but uh, think about this. It's one thing to classify your content with these labels, but those taxonomies are not gonna stay static. They're gonna change. And you're gonna have to reclassify your content over and over and over again. So having an auto classifier to apply all the taxonomic labels to your, to your objects is a godsend uh, and easily justifiable financially. And they're not that expensive uh, compared to the hours person hours that your writers would be putting in to classifying your content manually uh, over and over again. Uh, here's a tough concept. I'm going to move into ontology and knowledge graph, and I'm going to try to break it down and make it simple as I can for everybody. Some of you probably can run circles around me, but I'll do my best. Uh, a triple is what they call is the core structure of an ontology, basically, or of a knowledge base. It consists of three basic things either a, a subject, a predicate, and an object. And they call that a triple. So if I wanna create a, uh, a model, right? I have, you know, Michael is my subject. I have an employer, uh, Avalara, you know, uh, I'm sorry, is, is my object and, and, you know, and has or is a, you know, has a, is, is the predicate, is the verb. And we create these models uh, to represent concepts. Uh, and that's what an ontology is. It's a model of concepts. It's, it's very much like a schema. You'll hear me say this a few times, very much like a did a DTD, which is really just a model. It's not the actual document instance, right? You create, if you're using data, for example, you have a schema or a DTD, and that governs, that's the model of concepts. And then you can create specific real physical document instances, a real topic, a real concept, a real uh, reference article. And that's a physical article, but you create these triples and they get stored in this database called an RDF database, and then you can query it. And that's the fundamental understanding of, or the, or the most fundamental element of what's, of, of what's an ontology and a knowledge graph is made of. And they both, both an, an ontology and a knowledge graph both use the same structure, uh, making it easy, but I'll explain that. So, an ontology identifies the relationships between concepts, okay? Full stop, right? It, it is not the physical representation of physical things. It's not a representation of your physical topics in your database, okay? Uh, it, it tells the machine what the relationships are. So think about it. Uh, if I have, a, um, I, I have a, a data map, for example, a collector, uh, it can have children, it can have topics, and the topics could be a, a type of topic, like, a, um, you know, a, it could be a concept, a task, a reference, or a Q&A. Uh, those aren't real physical files, but those are the concepts or the model or uh, the, against which we're going to create real topics. Uh, and it, it consists of these triples. Uh, and stored, and it acts like very much like a schema. And because we're in the content world, I like to use that analogy that it really is like a, a DTD or a schema is to, to XML. Uh, it can be, in fact, I'll show you what the data the DTD looks like or, or schema looks like as an ontology. Uh, but what that does is it enables the machine to index through huge amounts of content in your content management systems uh, at lightning speed because it, because it doesn't work. It's it, it's better. It's it's eons better than index search. With index search, yeah, you're indexing your content, but it's got to go read everything. With with like a knowledge graph and an ontology, it you don't need to do that. It can quickly go through terabytes of data and find and retrieve things that it needs very quickly. 
And the ontology is the basis for building your knowledge graph, just like your data DTD is the basis for building your data topics. Same thing, it really is no different. It took me a little while to realize it was that simple, but it is that simple. Um, so for example, uh, I'll, I'll show you one. Here's, this is data. Um, here's a data map, right? Uh, you know, uh, there's book map, you know, is a subclass of, of, of a generic map. You can have a learning map instead of a generic data map. That's a subclass. So there's your triple right there. Learning map, you know, is, is there's a predicate, a subclass of, and there's your object, you know, map. Uh, if you look off to the next one, I'll go to the next one. Here's a concept article uh, illustrated as conceptual ontology, right? You can see that a data concept, you know, can have, uh, you know, prod info, it could have image, it could have cross references. It has all these different resources. And um, again, these are not the, this, these, this, this does not represent the physical database of, of actual topics. That's what a graph does, right? So you take this and then you model, you, you create a graph from your actual content database. So knowledge graph represents facts of real life physical entities, relationships uh, and descriptions. And then that's what creates a graph. And you can see over here in the illustration that you're no longer looking at concepts. You're looking at real things, right? Einstein, you know, uh, Hans Albert Einstein is a son of Albert Einstein. So, you know, uh, it's really important that, you know, this is very much like your, your written topic that's stored with a file name and a file type in your database. Uh, it, it represents literal pointers to the data, uh, to the actual topics themselves. Uh, so where the ontology provides uh, I got this reversed in my text, uh, where, where the ontology provides a, a representation of concepts that the, the text, the, the, the knowledge graph represents the actual real life instances, just like your ditto or your articles or real in document instances as well. Uh, the knowledge graph adds additional edge data, additional uh, detail about those physical objects that can then be queried uh, and, and, and inferences can then be generated to discover new things that you could never know about your content. Uh, so here's an, a nice you know, comparison of the three, right? Taxonomy is static. It's just a classification of things. Uh, they could be a list or a hierarchy. Uh, they could cover a multiple domain of, of subject matter. Uh, but the problem is, is it doesn't tell you anything about the relationships uh, to other branches of, uh, of that taxonomy. The ontology gives you the conceptual relationships uh, for a specific domain. So uh, tax compliance is my domain. I happen to be working for a tax compliance company. So we might have the concepts of uh, tax returns, uh, uh, tax rates, right? But that's not specific tax rates or a specific kind of tax return. Those are just concepts that might be mapped out as an ontology. Um, and, and you can go out and you can find these ontologies out there. There's many of them that are already in existence that cover different domains or different subject areas, uh, or you can create your own if one doesn't exist with, for your particular type of business or the kind of content that you want to, uh, you know, create a schema for basically. A knowledge graph though, is you extend the ontology. Uh, you basically add the real information about your, your, your content. And in this case, we don't want to have to physically do that. We can, we, can, we can take our ontology and we can point it at a CMS and say, generate my graph uh, and, and, and do it for me. And, and it, it will. Um, and, and now you've got a map of all of the relationships of all of your content, all of your uh, maps and topics and references and, and, and images and everything else that now have these relationships that can be queried and you can do a whole lot with them. And I'll show you what some of those applications are. In a tool to create those things, this is another shot out of Pool Party. Uh, it's pretty easy to create those relationships. Uh, you know, uh, you create the triple and boom, you've got, it generates those neat little graphs um, and, and, and pictures, but this is the data part of it that, uh, that you use. 
it's, it's really not very difficult to learn uh, and use. Uh, then we move into breaking down content silos. Uh, you know, the notion of a content lake is growing. Uh, take all of your, your content from all these different silos and the ready to publish content and, and put a copy of it, a publishable copy of it in a lake and then deliver it to any channel. Uh, there's a couple of great, great systems out there, great CMSs. They're not authoring CMSs. They're literally headless delivery CMSs that are meant to aggregate content from multiple backends. And it's a really good way to create a, uh, a way to, dis to separate your content backends from your content front ends so that you can combine content uh, from any source while letting the individual genre of content be developed in a purpose specific CMS on the back end. Uh, so you don't develop learning material in the same CMS that you develop product documentation. You don't develop marketing material in the same CMS that you develop uh, you know, developer material. Uh, I say embrace the silo. When I say that, I mean embrace the content creation silo, uh, but bring it together in a middle layer so that you can distribute it in any combination to any channel. And taxonomy and ontology will help you do that. So this is the problem that, that our, our users face today. They're forced to come into our businesses and go to all these different places to get all the content uh, that they need, right? They have to go to multiple portals. Uh, everything's in different source formats. It's siloed, their output is in different formats. Uh, the, con the content can't be integrated to create a singular experience. And, and we know all the things that we've tried that don't work over the years. So, you know, using the idea of a content lake uh, where you can feed it and augment it with these semantic assets like taxonomy it can drive this deliver to any channel model. And so I'll show you my model, my actual physical model that I'm building at Avalara. And this is what it looks like implemented, right? Where you, I've got, you know, product content out here being developed in an Exiosoft system. Uh, you might have, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, one from, you know, uh, any other number of vendors. They're all good. Uh, we got learning content. I've got in learning content coming from Skilljar. Marketing contents being developed in, in Go AEM. Confluence for sales enablement. Uh, got tax content rates and tables being done in relational databases. Uh, partner content and support in Salesforce. So what we can do is through a connector, many of these headless CMSs allow us to publish uh, content in any format into the lake. And then through these other connectors that are either, either out of the box or that you can have your developers or your vendor build, deliver it to any of these channels in any combination so that when any customer comes to any one of these channel endpoints, they can have all of the information they need that is necessary for them to complete their task. And this is a really good model. And what we're doing here is we're, we're powering this lake with this content intelligence, especially the taxonomy. And then we can use the ontology and the knowledge graph to do really advanced things. But the taxonomy is the, is the baseline thing that you want to power a content lake. I just wanted to show you that model because that's the model that I'm building right now at, at Avalara. Okay, next. Uh, other things that we do in our shops that are, that are could be highly valuable inputs to the process. Um, businesses need to solve and users need to solve a lot of complex scenarios, as I said earlier, not just one-off tasks. Um, most are sequenced multitask workflows. Uh, you know, we're so used to creating prescriptive tables of contents and organization uh, that support everybody, right? But nobody in particular. But we can model and encode uh, patterns of organization of content that a machine can pick up and then automatically organize the content for the user on the other end. So we can do that with workflow patterns and micro workflows, or sometimes I used to call them micro journeys. Many companies are doing that. They lay out for your product what the series of tasks are that a user has to do to get a particular uh, end result done. And if that's done in a, in a machine readable format, we can feed that in combination with a knowledge graph and have the machine automatically organize, retrieve and organize the information that we want to deliver to help these customers do their tasks. 
And then we can use those patterns for the machine learning to learn from when the user uh, modifies the organization of that content or adds to the collection of content or removes content from the collections that we deliver. So, uh, you know, here's where we're really trying to go. We're trying to generate multiple graphs of multiple, multiple knowledge graphs from multiple sources. We want to obviously graph our content database, uh, you know, and, and, and get a, all these relationships and be able to, to uh, you know, to, to do discovery of what's in our database, find the gaps and things like that. Uh, we can graph our personalization data. We can graph our workflow patterns and our micro workflows, those, those multitask scenarios I talked about. Uh, our tables of contents become patterns uh, that are starting, uh, beginning patterns for, for, for even organizing and even relationship tables if you're a data person uh, and links actually uh, provide organizational content that are all, they're all potential patterns that can be used. And we want to take these and we want to use these to feed to a CMS so that the CMS can dynamically organize and deliver the content to our user. So what does that look like? Um, what are the applications we can create? And this is, this is pay dirt right here, right? Uh, we can do discovery and insights. Um, and I gave just a couple of ideas here. Uh, there's a whole slew of them. We can mine a graph. Uh, we, we can mine a graph of your content corpus to discover duplicate content, overlapping content, conflicting information, and gaps. Uh, we can discover the effectiveness of the content, uh, not only what's used, you know, but what content is unused, underused, and why. Uh, and there, it's not used, and what they're using instead or what the alternative actions the users take as a result, uh, that's not discoverable easily. Uh, we can provide answers to these elusive questions we've had as to what role does post-sales content play in revenue generation. We can actually create graphs of our customers' uh, purchasing patterns against our content usage using a graph, and we can actually finally prove to the C-suite that our post-sales content is contributing to revenue and how much. That would be an amazing feat to accomplish. It's been elusive for many years. Uh, we can create precision answers like I talked about. We can rip out um, you know, micro content out of the, out of the bowels of our, our, of, of our topic files or our task files. Um, we can make smart recommendations. Um, we can do dynamic assistance where we adjust what we're delivering based on what the user is doing at the current moment. Uh, we can have autom autonomic content, which is a dynamic collection of content and, and the machine sequences it automatically based on what the user is either doing in, in real time uh, or based on, on changes in those, in those patterns that we've actually created. Uh, you know, and we can even, even make it truly progressive as the user wants more information, say they're in a bot and they want more information, we can expand and contract like an elastic uh, how much information we're giving them and or, or what the recommendations are in addition to those uh, to those answers. So that's just a few a few examples of things that you can do with these knowledge graphs. Here's an example of what you can do today on the left uh, with taxonomy. Uh, we can take all these different topics uh, from all these different collections, all these different guides, and we can we can make a, a semantically similar content collection. Certain systems do this today. I know Zoom and does it out of the box. Uh, if you've got taxonomy assigned to your content, if you combine that with a graph and your patterns, now the machine can out, not automatic, then the machine can not only create that list of semantically similar content, it can organize it in a sequence necessary to do a specific scenario. And that's what the power of a graph will ultimately give you. Um, you know, responsive content, automatically change, expand, contract, even repair the content. You know, we write uh, knowledge articles and support that don't make it back into the content. Well, gee, wouldn't it be really cool if the machine can tell us? Guess what? This graph of your, of, of your knowledge article base and this graph of your product knowledge base, uh, there's relationships here that you're not aware of that we need to update your mainline topics in your in your base uh, product documentation, uh, and we can actually then stop, deflect cases, and measure that deflection, and that boils down to real dollars. For example, um, 
you know, the user is constantly giving you signals. You cannot not communicate. Uh, if the user, you know, is, 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 is adjusting those collections that you're giving them, that's feedback. That's machine learning fodder that can be used to further refine your models uh, but have, or have the machine re, re, uh, re, re, define those or refine those models. Uh, you know, what if, the, what if we give the user the ability to highlight content? You know, like with a yellow highlighter, could we take that back as signals? There's all kinds of signals we can get back from the user, not just static personalization data. Uh, it's in a profile. We can do some of these things in real time today. So this is the roadmap, right, that we talked about. You know, we create those intelligent objects, harmonize your content types, align your content models, define your content journeys, develop your terminology, define and apply your taxonomies, uh, build that ontology and ultimately knowledge graphs. Uh, and that will feed a, a, an advanced knowledge or, or graph driven uh, knowledge environment. There's some freaky ideas we've got. We're not sure if they'll work, but what if we use blockchain to, to you know, with, with private wallets to uh, optionally with consent track users' behaviors uh, and capture those as utterances and use that as feedback for training the machine learning? Very possible to do. What if we create ontologies that are valuable in our industry and we want to share them with others and make money from it? Well, gee, we can use NFTs to do that today. Uh, it's a great way to share something that's a valuable resource and collect monetary value from it, for example, or of your content itself. Um, so real interesting possibilities with uh, even blockchain and content as well today. Uh, so I know I blasted through this in 55, 50 minutes. Um, if you see the two links below, I, I mentioned them earlier, thinkingdocumentation.com. That's a full paper. Like I said, it's, it really goes through this in excruciating detail. Um, much more deeply than I was able to do today, uh, and I hope more fun reading. Um, the other link down here is called thinkingdocs.com, a little different website. This is a discussion forum that I set up. I formed an industry consortia, a guild for graph-driven content, and I just launched it last night. We had our first meeting. If anybody's doing any of this work with uh, ontologies and graphs, uh, write me. You can find me easily on LinkedIn. Uh, we're looking for members of the guild that are pushing forward into this space. Uh, we've got Cisco, we've got Microsoft, we've got Juniper Networks represented. These are all companies and more that are, um, that are actually forging ahead into this space. Uh, Microsoft's about a year and a half into it right now. Uh, I know a few others that, that are either less or more into it, uh, but everybody's learning from everybody else and this forum that I created is wide open. It's a public forum. Uh, I moderate it so that you can ask questions. Uh, you can read uh, feedback and it, it just kicked off. So I seeded it with about 15, 10 or 15 different topics to discuss. But I hope some of you who are interested might uh, go there and add your questions or add your uh, information and, and share with others because we're gonna try to push this whole industry forward beyond intelligent content into knowledge graph driven uh, content. So with that, I got a great uh, bibliography. This whole chart deck is downloadable as well from the download portion of my website. And I hope you found it interesting and somewhat useful. And I'm here as long as you all need to answer questions. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to uh, type the chat and or uh, share your video and uh, have it read out loud. We've got one question here from Liz. Uh, how does intelligent content design account for things like screenshots, diagrams, videos, etc.? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, they're just objects. Uh, we're not just talking about text objects. Anything can be an object, a, a con an intelligent content object. Uh, a video can be an intelligent content object. We have to associate uh, the taxonomy, for example, that describes it, maybe uh, and link it, right? Associate the definition of, of, of that. We can, wrap, we can wrap it in something like JSON or DETA and then use the wrapper to contain the intelligence, or we can do it as sort of a little side table and have, as long as your CMS supports that uh, or properties within your, your, your CMS. So a PowerPoint, an Excel file, an MP4 video, uh, a standalone graphic, uh, a learning module, 
those are all objects uh, and they can all be associated with taxonomy and they can all be used in the content lake to be mixed and matched uh, for delivery uh, to your users. Awesome. Uh, we've got a, a statement here that I'll frame it as a question from Tina. Um, how much would the whole tool and infrastructure cost? Uh, and then how much return do you estimate for that setup? Yeah, it's, it's definitely an investment. Uh, because, you know, if, if you don't have a CMS today, that's, you know, that's really difficult just to begin with. Uh, so this does mean that, you know, you, you do need to have a CMS. Now, if, depending on, on what you go with, um, they, they're scalable. Uh, there's some that are, that are complete that provide both the, uh, that provide both the content creation and the content delivery all in one. Uh, I can name a whip off a couple of names of companies, RWS, Trident. Uh, then you've got, uh, if you already have a CMS and you want to add a content link, you've got Fluid Topics. Uh, you've got Zoomin, which I'm, I'm using in my shop. They're great, uh, great content links. Uh, you've got Ingenuix. Uh, you know, they can all be uh, enhanced with the taxonomy and they're all moving toward the ability to either ingest or process ontology and, and knowledge graphs as we're progressing. They're, they're sort of on the road there right now. So now's the time to build all of your intelligent content objects, do your terminology, do your taxonomy, and start to define some of those, uh, some of those, uh, those ontologies and graphs. The graph tools are really actually not that expensive. There's a bunch of open source ones that are free, including graph databases. So if your budget's tight, you can go out and get some free ones. Uh, an enterprise ontology graph system like Bull Party, you're talking under 100K, you know, anywhere from, and that's a full, you know, test and development environment and hosting and everything else. I mean, it's given you're supporting an entire enterprise. And oh, by the way, what I discovered was when I started doing when I started doing this with these semantic uh, technologies for taxonomy and, and graphs and things, I found out all the engineering teams had the same problem and they want to create taxonomies and ontologies to unite all of their APIs and all of their, all of their content models for their applications. So it becomes a cost sharing option. Uh, it's easy to go to your engineering teams and say, hey, let's team up. I need this for my content. You need this for your engineering. Hey, let's split the bill and make it cheap. Uh, great way to approach doing, uh, getting some of that, that technology in-house uh, without, you know, breaking the bank. Awesome. Uh, we've got a comment from June. Your presentation was so awesome. So thank you thank to you. June here. Uh, question, is there a company of a particular size where this sort of approach makes it worth doing? Um, comment here, I would think only very large companies. And correct me if I'm well, wrong. Not really. Um, I would say mid Mid and large are probably the best position for it. Uh, I worked for IBM. It was monstrous. Like I said, had a content corpus that was 60 million pages. We trimmed it. We got it down to half or less uh, by just getting rid of translated versions uh, that, we, that weren't being used. Uh, and now here I'm working in a small, rather small to mid-sized company uh, with maybe 20 writers um, and uh, still sizable. I know there's a lot of shops for only one and two and three people. Um, but, but I would say, you know, a, a mid, mid-sized company that's got maybe, uh, anything more than 10,000, 20,000 pages, uh, you can benefit from this tremendously. In fact, it's even better if you're a growing company and you don't have a master, a, a massive corpus because you will, and doing this early gets you set up for growth. Cool. I know we're a bit past time. I'm going to read this question here. And then again, if anyone needs to head out, uh, you're more than welcome to. I've set the links in the chat and I'll share them again here for Michael's information, his LinkedIn and his uh, websites. So feel free to get uh, those onto a browser of your choice that way. But this last question will be from uh, Elisa. So uh, comment. I'm really excited about the idea of creating intelligent content that is personalized, but I'm also mindful of the need to balance that against the need for privacy and compliance with international privacy laws like the GDPR. Would it be about making sure that the user has consented to participate to have their habits tracked and building content from that? 
Oh yeah, even more so. Uh, first of all, it has to be consent based. Period. It just no option. So you know, we we have the notion of entitled content typically and non entitled content. So with entitled content, you always want people to be logging in and be authenticated to your system, single sign on, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but if if they want to provide personal, if they want personalized, uh, customized content, then they really need to log in, have credentials, and they need to consent to doing so. Uh, if you're collecting personalized information, uh, it depends. If the user's providing it, that's one thing. If you're pulling it from their accounts, uh, where you might interlock with your 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 finance side, uh, you need to make sure that that's anonymized uh, information. Uh, so th that's really important. The other thing with some of these systems is a taxonomy allows you to filter content. It allows you to filter it by any any which way you want to do it. But you can do it by role. Uh, you can do it by content type. So in my system, I, in my content leak, I've got internal only content and that's maybe only for internal salespeople. And it also contains content for external people, people uh, external users, you know, regular help documentation, whatever it happens to be, uh, learning materials. Uh, because the stuff, because the content is taxonomically labeled, we can say anything with this taxonomic classification is external only and or internal only uh, or, or whatever, or you know, for everybody. And we can make sure that content coming out of the lake that's being delivered to any channel, that, in, that internal content, internal only content or confidential content, classified content, never sees the light of day based on role. So one of your taxonomies that you create is, could be a role taxonomy to do that kind of segmentation. So it's really multiple, multifaceted, you have to comply with GDPR, you, you know, you got to keep any personal information and any personally sensitive personal identifying information absolutely uh, private. And you have to give give users the way to remove it from your system within a, a very limited amount of time, a very short amount of time, if they request to limit, uh, to remove it, re remove their information from the system. So you do need to make sure that your CMS vendor provides that capability, or if you're rolling your own system, that you build that into your system as well. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. And thanks again to everyone with their questions. Uh, I've got the links in the chat. You're more than welcome to get in touch with Michael through his LinkedIn page there or his websites.